Hello. Welcome. Thanks for coming. Seat right down in the front. You can see, get, get front row. My name is Rob Alexander. I'm a solutions architect based out of Seattle. We're going to be talking for the next solid hour about Elastic Block Store and uh, covering everything from what makes up the service, all the characteristics of it, performance, best practices around reliability, security, and performance. Um, I'm going to try to save some time at the end for questions. If I don't, I promise I'll stay in the back, uh, hang out in the hallway, and answer all your questions that you have. So let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, real quick, a, a piece of housekeeping. Uh, the folks that actually build our service, services, our storage services, are uh, having an office hours. Details are up there. Please go check that out if you want to talk to the engineers. And first, I wanted to kind of orient ourselves in the, in the world of storage so, so we know what space we're playing with, with block storage. So um, there are three large categories of, of storage service options. So the first, and what we're talking about today, is block storage, where you know, an operating system interacts with a device at a byte level and transfers data on a fixed-sized block. So that is best represented by Amazon Elastic Block Store, which is what we're talking about today. Uh, File-based storage system, something like Amazon Elastic File System, moves up a step in the abstraction. And instead of direct uh, byte-level interaction with a storage device, you're now talking file system semantics. So that's something abstracted by a network file system like NFS. And the best representation at AWS is the EFS. And finally, object storage, where you move up yet another degree in abstraction where your application is actually talking at preferably with a RESTful interface, HTTP, to a web service where you're storing uh, objects with APIs, very simple API calls, get, put, delete objects. And obviously Amazon S3 is our key service offering here with Glacier also being one of our object store offerings. So within the, the block storage world at AWS, we kind of divide it into three specific block storage offerings. The first of those being uh, what was our first block store offering, which launched with EC2 back in 2006, over 10 years ago, which is EC2 Instance Store. An Instance Store is the actual physical disks that are local to the physical host hosting your instance. So the key characteristics of EC2 Instance Store is that it's non-persistent. It, it only exists for the life of the instance. So if you stop the instance or you terminate the instance, whatever data is on that local store is, is gone. Um, it will obviously endure a reboot, but any API commands that, that, that do away with the instance, the data goes with it. The data is not replicated by default. You can, of course, uh, do some replication schemes on the data itself uh, between instances, but by default, there's no replication service offered with Instance Store. And same with snapshot support. There's no out-of-the-box offering for backups. That's also something you will have to do for Instance Store. And there is SSD and HDD offerings for uh, Instance Store. And then we get into the, into the EB, into categories of EBS. So we divide that into our SSD backed, so solid state drive backed volume types. And those are the general purpose two and the provisioned IOPS volume types. And then the HDDD, so the magnetic spinning disk backed volumes, which are the throughput optimized, the ST1, and the cold HDD, the SC1. So you can see the, the three, three strata there of, of block service offerings. So what is EBS? EBS is block storage as a service. So with an API call, you're able to configure a set amount of of volume blocks with certain performance characteristics and then attach those to an EC2 instance. So as a, as a storage service, it's obviously you're accessing these blocks over the network and we'll talk about a lot of those characteristics that make that an important thing to consider with EBS. And it's also very important to note that, that EBS is not, a volume is not a specific hard drive. If you call an a, the API call it create a volume, we don't go tag a hard drive that's yours. Um, EBS is a massive distributed system. And uh, as a massive distributed system, 
your volume is a logical volume, and it's, it's comprised of, of blocks that are distributed across many, many physical devices. So that leads to a lot of the performance, uh, reliability, and availability characteristics we'll uh, talk about. Uh, volumes are specific to an availability zone, so they need to be uh, accessed by an instance that's in that same availability zone. They can persist independent of the instance itself, so you can attach and detach. Um, you need to unmount those file systems from your instances first to have a good experience attaching and detaching from the operating system's perspective. Um, but they're, you know, and, and root, obviously, you're not gonna, gonna go detaching that one. But um, other than those two caveats, uh, the volumes themselves are independent of the EC2 instances. And you know, EBS volume can only be attached to one instance at a time, but you can have many volumes attached to a single instance. So it's very common, and we, all, we recommend to separate out boot and data volumes, and that's for a lot of reasons. One I just mentioned, you, know, you keep the boot nice, clean, and small, and then your data volumes you can move around very flexibly. Uh, it also allows you to d divide up exactly what workloads are running against which volume types. So each block that comprises your, your EBS logical volume is also replicated within the same availability zone. And it's important to note that you're only paying for the storage you've allocated for the volume. You're not paying for the replicated data. But this leads to some very interesting uh, service characteristics. So uh, as an availability target, five nines of service availability, so access to your volumes. And for durability, so the durability of the data that's on your uh, volumes, 0.1 to 0.2 AFR, annual failure rate. So that's about, it's about 20 times greater than your average you know, enterprise class uh, hard disk drive, which is about 4%. So that means if you run day in, day out, about 1,000 EBS volumes for a year, you can expect to lose one or two, which is why we also have the snapshot service. So these are point-in-time backups of the data on your volumes that are stored in S3, which is a regional service. It's not tied to a specific availability zone. And it obviously has a greater magnitude with 11 nines of durability with S3. So you have a much greater magnitude of data durability uh, for your snapshots. So a snapshot itself, how does it work? So the first time you take a snapshot, it's going to copy uh, every modified block on your volume to S3. Uh, any subsequent snapshots to the same volume are going to be incremental, so they're only going to evaluate what's changed since that first one and move up those change blocks. And deleting snapshots within that volume sequence of, of snapshots, it will only remove data that's exclusive to that snapshot. So what can you do with a snapshot? So with a snapshot, you can create an Amazon machine image, so a blueprint for launching more instances. And obviously, when you launch those instances, they'll have whatever data and characteristics were part of that snapshot. You can uh, create new volumes, either in the same availability zone or different availability zone. And you can also create a, a new size of volume. So if you wanted to take a snapshot and then create a larger volume size, you could do that with a snapshot. And then you can copy them to other regions, copy them to other accounts. This is a very common DR strategy to keep you know, golden images of all your uh, key applications and move them around to other regions for disaster recovery. And you can also share snapshots. So you can either share them with other internal accounts that you have within your company, or you can share them publicly. And I like to point out that a very good example of this is there's a whole wealth of public data sets that are available as snapshots, so you can literally go and look them up and launch a snapshot that will, will load up with data, whether that's census data, genomic data, weather data, transportation data, and, and it's all snapshot based. And obviously all of the marketplace AMIs that you're launching, whether that's Amazon Linux or, 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 or Windows, those are all based on and backed by EBS snapshots. So another characteristic of, of the EBS service is EBS optimized. And 
EBS optimized is about the network bandwidth to EBS. So by default, if I fire up a C32X large and I use my favorite bandwidth testing tool, whether that's iPerf or NetPipe or pick your, pick your tool, you'll find that a C32X large has about 125 megabytes of throughput of network bandwidth allocated to it. But that bandwidth is shared not just to the network communication to your EBS volumes, but everything else that you might be doing with that instance. So whether that's other EC2 instances or accessing the internet, S3 databases, that 120 megabytes a second is for everything. EBS optimized, though, if you enable EBS optimized, gives you dedicated bandwidth to EBS. So I basically effectively double my bandwidth there, and I get a dedicated 125 megabytes a second specifically to EBS. So this is enabled by default in a lot of our, our newer instance types, C4s, D2s, M4s, P2s, which means it comes at no extra cost. Um, some of the other uh, generation instances that do not have it enabled by default, you can enable it for a nominal cost. It can be enabled at instance launch, or you can do it later. Uh, it's just a stop start of the instance to enable it. And it's not an option on a few instance types. Uh, the, the top end of the C3, R3, and I2s, the 8XLs, uh, those have the full 10 gig that was available to the physical host. So it's kind of up to you to do what you want with the 10 gig. And if you want to know on a per instance type basis exactly how much bandwidth is allocated to each one for EBS optimized, that's in that link down there at the bottom. And the last characteristic of the service that I like to point out is encryption. So encryption with EBS is, is just dead simple. It's literally a check. And it, uh, it boot or data volumes can be encrypted. You can attach both encrypted and unencrypted volumes to the same instance type. It's supported by any of our current generation instance types. There's no volume performance impact. Um, snapshots are encrypted. Data at rest is encrypted. Data at flight is encrypted. Any snapshot you create from an encrypted snapshot is also encrypted. And there's no extra cost. And it literally is a checkbox. You see there, I'm creating my volume. I'm gonna check the encryption, off you go. So now we covered all the characteristics of the service. Let's, let's dive into the actual volume types that we mentioned in the beginning. So I, I mentioned we have two platforms, one based on solid state drives and one based on hard disk drives. And uh, you, know, you might ask why we did that. And they have very different uh, performance characteristics and very different physics related to them. So solid state disks obviously are RAM based, there's no moving parts. Um, and the flash, the, you know, the more banks you stack in there, the more parallel IO you can drive to an SSD. And all points on the disk are equally accessible. So they're fantastic for you know, random IO. You don't, you're not penalized for any random. Whereas on a spinning hard disk, you, know, you have to get that head exactly to where you need to read, and that can take, you know, seek times or some of the most performance impacting uh, remaining performance blockers in, in modern computing. So, but if you get that head in the right place, hard disk drives can deliver some serious se sequential performance, uh, sequential throughput, and uh, at a very compelling price point. So there's still a lot of room for the hard disk drive platforms, and that's why, you know, we still can't, we, you know, just this year, we came out with two new volume types that are based on spinning hard drives. So again, we have the two, the GP2 and the IO1 for SSD, and we have the two for hard disk drives, ST1 and SC1. So how do you decide like, how you should be using these? How do you, should you think about these volume types? So uh, the question I would pose to you is, what do you consider more important for your workload? Is it IOPS or is it throughput? Or do you not know yet? Or do you not really care? And that's an easy answer. So GP2 is our jack of all trades. So GP2 is, uh, has a dead simple provisioning model. You tell us how much storage you want. And for every gigabyte you provision, you get three IOPS. It has a burst model. So up to a terabyte in size, you can burst up to 3,000 IOPS, no matter what you provision. So you have your baseline of one to three. And then you have 3,000 to burst. Over a terabyte in size, you'll, you will get what you have provisioned in baseline. A, a volume can go up to 160 megabytes a second in throughput. Uh, 
single digit millisecond latencies, obviously, because we're dealing with SSDs here, and the capacity is up to 16 terabytes for a single volume. Uh, I will point out all these uh, storage numbers that I am uh, giving you are, even though I'm saying gigabytes, it's Gebby bytes, and I'm just not going to say that over and over. But we provision everything at EBS uh, base 2. So it's not a typical storage world of base 10. Everything you see is base 2, which means it's, you're actually getting about 7% more than what you might think you're getting. Uh, and when I talk about IOPS with EBS, uh, we benchmark everything and, and measure everything against the 16 kebabyte, that's the last time I'm saying that, 16 KB uh, block size. So when I say uh, up to 10,000 IOPS on a GP2 volume, that's at 16K. You can do some quick math, 10,000 times 16K is your 160 megabytes a second of maximum throughput to volume. So these are great for just about everything. You know, they're not our absolute fastest, and they're not our absolute cheapest, but they fit the widest range of workloads. So they're our default for all of our boot volumes. They're great for bursty workloads. Uh, and they're great if you just you don't know exactly how much IOPS you need. You don't, you're not able to say on a very consistent basis exactly what you need. So here's just a, a quick diagram of, of how the burst and base works. So 100 IOPS is the minimum. So even if you provision a one gig uh, volume, you're not going to get three IOPS to that. Uh, that would not be good. So 100 IOPS uh, baseline, uh, it ramps up to, you see, just over three terabytes, you get to the max of 10,000. And then that's the burst, up to 3,000 for volume sizes up to a terabyte. So you see there at a 300 gig, I've got 1,000 IOPS, and I can burst to 3,000. And so how, do, how does this burst model actually work? It's based on a token bucket. And for GP2, you're always accumulating IOPS constantly at three IOPS per every gig gigabyte you've provisioned into this bucket. The bucket can go up to 5.4 million credits, and it actually starts. So all the volumes you create start with a full token bucket. And then you can spin that at 3,000 3, IOPS per second, which is the burst. So burst. like. Um, Seems like that's a very uh, transient thing. It might be things measured in seconds you might be able to get out, but it actually is a very uh, significant amount of time that you can actually burst. So for example, a 300 gig volume, you can burst solid 3,000 IOPS for 43 minutes. Now, I think burst is actually a, kind of a misleading term, but I'm not in marketing. Um, 500 is an hour. And then the you know, closer you get to terabyte, the closer you get to infinity for the burst, so that you get up to 10 hours of solid burst if you're up on the 900 gig. So how do you, how do you watch your burst? Um, there's a metric for burst balance in GP2. You can see here I bursted for a solid hour. You can see my plateau. And that's where I was at 900,000 right IOPS over five minutes. So these CloudWatch metrics for GP2 in five minute increments. So you got to do a little math. So that's 3,000 IOPS, and you can see I ran out of my burst right there and floored it, and then it dropped down to my baseline, which was half of that, 450,000 IOPS. So back to our question. We'll cover GP2. We'll stick with IOPS for now. So the first question to ask if IOPS is the most important thing for your workload is how many IOPS do you need? So if the answer to that is greater than 65,000, then the options are I2. Of course, this slide is now out outdated because we announced <laughs> I3 this morning. Um, so why 65,000? That is the maximum amount if you do 65,000 times 16K. That's 10 gig of bandwidth. So 10 gig is currently, as of today, the most EBS bandwidth you can get to a single instance. So if you're, if you're driving more than 10 gig of of IO traffic, then you need to consider something like I2, which is, which is our IO you know, specialized. The IO2 itself does over 300,000 uh, random reads and writes. The, the I3 that we announced today is nine times that, so up to three million. So it's a different uh, category of number of IOPS. But if you're in the range of 65,000 and below, then the next question is, what are your latency requirements? So if, you're, if your latency requirements are in mics, we're talking microseconds, 
you're back to the I2 again. So the I2, I3 is specialized for, uh, again, local instant store, local SSDs, the, the lowest latency you can get. But if you're in the sing single digit millisecond category, then what's more important? Cost or performance? Well, we talked about GP2. That's the cost model for the IOPS-based work workloads. It's the most uh, cost efficient volume type. But if performance is your main driver for your workload, then we're back to provision IOPS, so the IO1 volume type. So when I say performance, what do I mean? And it's really a couple of things. So first of all, if you see the numbers, everything's doubled from GP2. So instead of 10,000 uh, IOPS as the, as the top end, it's 20,000. Throughput also doubled. Instead of 160, it's 320. But it's also the consistency of performance that's most important with provision IOPS. So provision IOPS, you set exactly how much you want. And we guarantee to deliver that within 10% of that number 99.9% .9 of the time. GP2 is 99% of the time. So you get another nine of consistency of IOPS delivery. So provisioned IOPS is really ideal for mission critical workloads where you have a consistent level of IOPS and you know what that is and you can set that and you're, you have a high degree of guarantee to meet that target. So it's ideal for uh, critical applications, databases with sustained IOPS. And the provisioning model is a little different. You can, you can scale up much faster. So it's not storage based. You can turn the dial at a 50 to one ratio. So at a 400 gig size, you can have 20,000 IOPS to a volume. So very significant for like small, hot data sets, provision IOPS. So what if throughput is uh, the defining performance characteristic for your workload? Again, we start with uh, the first question. What's more important, small random I.O. or large sequential I.O.? And if you're doing small random I.O., you're back over to the SSD side of the house. As I mentioned, uh, the characteristics of what makes hard disk drives good is they're good at sequential throughput, large block sequential throughput. So again, aggregate throughput. This goes back to the 10 gig again, except on the throughput side of the house. Do you need more than 1,250 megabytes a second, which is 10 gig of throughput? If you do need more, then I recommend you check out our D2, which is our, which is our dense storage instance type, which has up to 48 terabytes of local spinning hard disk, and it can do upwards of three gigabytes a second of sequential throughput. If your throughput needs are less than 10 gigabits, so less than 1,250 megabytes a second, then again, what, what's more important, cost or performance? And if it's performance, then ST1 is the volume type you want to look at. So ST1 is the first of our throughput provisions. So instead of IOPS, now we're talking about megabytes a second. It's similar to GP2 in that you dial in amount of storage and you get a certain amount of throughput. So the baseline is 40 megabytes a second per, per terabyte that you provision up to a max of 500 per volume. And it also has a burst model. So every terabyte you provision, you get 250 megabytes of burst up to 500. And the capacity model is a little different. The smallest volume size is 500 gig, and it goes up to 16 terabytes too. So 500 gig, these are not designed to be boot volumes. Actually, they can't be boot volumes. So these are very much designed to be data for data only. So again, ideal for large block high throughput sequential workloads. So here's a, a quick look at the burst and base model for ST1. You can see you very quickly ramp up to the burst. So a two terabyte volume size, you're already at max burst. So as long as you have burst credits in your bucket, a two terabyte ST1 volume is equivalent in performance to a 13 terabyte volume, because they both have the maximum 500 megabytes of burst. And there's a quick example of, of an eight terabyte kind of halfway there in the middle, 320 baseline, and obviously the burst at 500. So the burst buckets, again, so a little different with the, the throughput volume types in that you're, you're still accumulating the stirless full bucket that you get 
when you create the volume, but the volume scale, I mean, the bucket scales with the volume. So the bigger the volume, the bigger the bucket. So again, spending at the burst, but if I have an eight terabyte volume, that bucket is now eight terabytes in credit. And the idea is that when you create a volume, it comes with the burst credits that will allow you to do a full volume scan of that volume. So last but not least, on the throughput side of the house, for your workload, if the most important is cost, cold HDD, so that's our SC1 volume type. And this is based on the same platform as ST1. Uh, it's just the, the performance characteristics are a little bit more modest. So for tr you, know, you trade baseline and burst numbers for uh, ha you know, half the price, basically. I mean, it's a very compelling uh, cost price. So instead of 40, we're at 12 per terabyte, up to a max of 192. And the burst is also half. So instead of 500, your max burst is now 250. So these are ideal for things, again, large sequential uh, workloads, but maybe not something you're going to be full scanning multiple times a day. Maybe you're only doing it one time a day. So whether that's logging or archiving or backups. Uh, but customers are finding some very interesting use cases because, um, as we'll see in a second, the, the cost is very compelling. And the throughput characteristics and the burst is still very, very good. Much better than you would get from any commodity hard drive. So real quick, the burst and base here. And again, you can see at the max volume type, you don't ever get to the actual uh, max burst for the volume size. So even at 16T. Same idea. Bucket is sized to the, to the volume. And you can spend it at the burst, 80. So there's a, kind of the map of the volume types. So there's some questions to ask yourself when you're looking at how you should judge these volumes, how you should choose them and use them. But what's important is that this is not a uh, all or nothing decision. So we'll get to a few use cases and what that means. But real quick, prices. So GP2, 10 cents a gig, that's it. You don't pay for IO or anything. You just uh, pay for the storage you provision and you get the, the three to one uh, IOPS ratio. IO1's a little different. You pay for both the storage and the amount of IOPS you provision. ST1 is uh, you know, four and a half cents a gig for throughput provisioned. And then SC1 is half of that, so two and a half cents per gig. So two and a half cents a gig, that, that's, um, you know, that's cheaper than S3. So it opens up some really interesting use cases when instead of an object store, you need like a POSIX file system to be available to you in an EBS volume that you can attach and have you know, data sets uh, uh, that can roam around and attach to different instances. And then finally, snapshot storage itself is five cents a gig a month. So I mentioned it's not an all-in-one decision. So uh, you know, the volume types, uh, the flexibility of EBS as a service really starts to exercise itself when you can choose multiple hybrid volumes for a workload. So you don't have to choose all ST1 or, or all GP2. They mix and match, even on the, the same instance, for different workload characteristics. So we'll go through a few uh, use cases for these hybrid volumes. So uh, Librato, which does uh, monitoring and metrics for the cloud, uh, they're doing a, a talk about uh, their experience uh, migrating to EBS for their Cassandra workloads, which uh, stores all their time series data. And they were running on I2, and they migrated to C4 with EBS. And uh, they were able, so they store the actual data files themselves, so the, the Cassandra SS, temp ta SS tables. Um, so, you know, very intensive, uh, small, random workloads dedicated to GP2. And then the streaming log, so the transaction log, the commit log for Cassandra, goes off to ST1. So each Cassandra node has uh, two different volume types mounted to it for very different uh, workloads. And you know, with this, they significantly reduce their mean time to recovery because they're not having to hydrate a whole I2 instance again if an I2 fails. Uh, and they saved a significant 35% uh, in, in cost. And here's another one, Zindex, Zendesk with their ELK stack. So they uh, did something very interesting with tiering their data. 
they were able to uh, not only reduce their cost by 60%, but increase the amount of data they were storing by three times in their Elasticsearch cluster by tiering out to different instance types. So for the really hot stuff, they put it on GP2, so that's for the first week of data. And then for you know, the warm stuff, they went out to sequential, to ST1, for eight to 30 days. And then, and then 30 to 60 days out, they used the SC1s. And then N4 has a case study out there. So they uh, still run their actual SQL Server database on I2s, but they do their backups using ST1. So they have ST1 uh, volumes attached to their I2s, and they do different kinds of backups to different volumes, and then they actually snapshot those volumes. So they found that their backups were actually significantly faster by offloading that to the volumes themselves, 30% faster. And then EMR, so our, our managed Hadoop framework, is also uh, supports EBS and has some very interesting ways to mix hybrid with uh, EMR. So EMR, again, has very different uh, workload characteristics depending on what you're doing. Uh, but a very con common pattern we see is customers using GP2 for the actual uh, yarn workload. So the really small stuff and uh, all the shuffle, spill, temp ops are very random small IO, does very well in GP2. And then the actual HDFS for the storage of Hadoop uh, the, is very large sequential I.O. It's very consistent. Um, so that's dedicated to HDFS with ST1. And then mounting multiple H ST1 volumes, because uh, Hadoop is really good at going against um, parallel mount points. So it can dedicate cores and tasks to each mount point. So lots of ST1s, and then the GP2 off to the side for the yarn stuff. And that'll be in the deck later. You can see this is what you would feed EMR to do exactly what I said. So dedicate certain uh, sites to, to different uh, volume types. All right, so let's dive into some very specific stuff on performance. So we talked about all these burst buckets and how we credit you and how IOs are, are work. How do we actually count that as a service? Like, how do we say you're using a certain number of IOPS to subtract from your bucket? So with, with counting IOPS for GP2 and IO1, uh, we merge sequential IOs up to a max size of 256 KB. And that's both to uh, minimize the IO charges on IO1. So if you're doing sequential workload, you'll get charged a lot less IO. And maximize burst for GP2. And keep in mind, this is all logical merging. We're not doing anything physical. I know that. It's going to matter to some of you. Um, and I, I have this boxcar. So the boxcar re is representing the, the maximum amount of, of throughput you can put to EBS. So each one of these is uh, 256K for GP2 and IR1. And as an example, sending down four random IOs of size 64K. They're not sequential, so they're not going to be able to pack those into one boxcar. So we're going to count four IOs against you, even though all that other capacity was still there. But if you send those 64K down as sequential, you'll be able to recognize that, logically merge those IOs, and even though it was four IOs to you, we only credit you one against your burst credits. And similarly, if you send down a very large one that's obviously larger than 256K, we're going to have to chop that up. So if you send down a meg IO for GP2 and IO1, we're going to chop that up into 256 KBs and charge you four. Now what about ST1 and SC1? So they're a little bit different. Um, in those cases, we merge up to a meg instead of 256K, um, as they're obviously designed for large sequential IOs. And so again, if you send four random IOs down to us on an ST1 or SC1 volume, at 64K, we're not going to be able to merge them. It's going to take four units. So you'll get charged for four megabytes of burst, you know, even though you only sent you know, much less data than that. So here's more ideal. So you send down four sequential IOs. Each IO is a full meg. Uh, 
you're taking advantage of, uh, of the full capacity of the, of the box car, and you get charged four IOs, and you transferred four megs, so perfect. And here's where things get interesting. Uh, when, you, when you have mixed workloads against ST1 and SC1, because in some cases, you know, the sequential IOs, they'll be able to be counted as a full IO, but the randoms are gonna still take up a full unit of capacity, a full one meg. So you'll end up, again, being charged for four megs, but you've only transferred about 1.4 megs. So how does this look when you actually look at your burst ba balance when you're transferring one meg? So this is five, this is full out for three hours against the burst credit. You can see I was able to burst for about three hours on a four terabyte, set, four terabyte volume. If I'm doing random, it's actually gonna drain at the same time because uh, every single random uh, or small block is gonna count and use the same amount of burst. I'm just not gonna be transferring a lot, so I'm not gonna be getting what's on the box. And to represent that even more graphically is if it was 500 megabytes for three hours, that's 5.4 terabytes of data transferred. But if I did that in 16K random, I would only transfer 87 gig. So it just illustrates that uh, you know, what the model is for these volume types is large block sequential throughput. So how do you verify that you're doing the right thing with these volume types? Um, with Linux, a good start is IOSTAT. You look at your average request size. That's in 512K sectors, uh, 512KB. So here you can see that your operating system is telling you you're doing a good job. You're transferring a full meg of your average request size. Perfmon for Windows will tell you the same thing. You can look at average uh, request size. And then CloudWatch. So CloudWatch has volume-specific metrics. You can go into the volume management console, you can go in the monitoring tab, and uh, we have per volume graphs set up for you to, to see average write size and average read size. So here you see we're at 128 uh, KB, which is actually ideal. This is what you wanna see. This is actually the maximum you'll see, uh, even if your operating system is telling you you're transferring a meg. Uh, and that's because this comes from the hypervisor's perspective. This is not from your instance type. So um, we will work on getting this to be um, more meaningful, but in the meantime, know that 128K is the max you will so see as, as your average write size, and that means you're in a good place. If you're seeing less than that, so if you're seeing something around 64, you're most likely interspersing some randoms in there or some smaller block sizes and getting your average down. And if you're seeing even less than that, so 44, this means one of two things. Uh, you're either at a very old Linux kernel, so 3.8 or, or less, which did not support a few uh, features that we'll talk about, or you're running Windows. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the Windows driver also does not, um, uh, does not support persistent grants, so uh, these are features of the uh, Zen device driver that we currently use today in AWS. So that uh, shows itself in the instance itself. So that's uh, block front for the instance and block back are the drivers in the hypervisor. So we'll talk a little bit about how that works so you understand why uh, kernel uh, version is so important. So user space process sends down some requests to your kernel your scheduler is running, um, you know, that might be NOOP or Deadline or CFQ, is gonna do some things with those. Uh, you might ask, you know, what scheduler should I be thinking about? Any SSD volume type? Uh, NOOP, that's the default, that's a no-brainer. Uh, HDD scheduler types uh, for EBS? Um, as my favorite EBS engineer <laughs> says, does it make a, does it make a difference in, the, in my scheduler? And, and he always says, definitely, maybe. Um, the fact is, the performance difference you'll, you'll see playing with schedulers is not, uh, is gonna be very workload dependent and it's not gonna be an extreme difference between one or the other. I would recommend no op or deadline, uh, play with your workload and see uh, what the performance differences are on your specific workload. But anyways, the, the kernel and the scheduler is gonna do some things with the IOPS coming down, whether that's merging them or rearranging them. 
And then it's going to send it into the, to the request queue. So this is a ring buffer for the Zen device driver that uh, interrupts between the instance itself and the hypervisor. And it's made up of 32 requests can be in the ring at any point in time in this buffer. So pre-3.8, the max size of any request was 44 KB. That was flat. So uh, with some uh, later enhancements to the Linux kernel, uh, you're able to, the default now is 128. So anything over a kernel version of 3.8, the default will be 128 KB for a request. And you're able to tune that up to a full meg. Uh, and that's what I meant. Windows does not support this. So Windows is, is stuck at 44. and on to the actual uh, hypervisor, and then on to EBS. And actually, the train, that all the train stuff, and the counting, and the logical merging we discussed, that happens back in the actual service. So that's where that is. Now, another change happened in Linux 4.2. So uh, Zen adopted the block MQ model in 4.2 afterwards. So block MQ did away with the old schedulers, and most of those schedulers were very much designed for optimizing workloads on hard disk drives, uh, and introduced BlockMQ, which does a, a queue request per core, which is great for SSDs, right? Because you can, each core has its own request queue. You can, you know, send down a lot of parallel parallel IOs. But what's good for SSDs is is not so great for hard disk drives. So uh, this is why we recommend that if you're running on a 4.2 or later kernel, that you crank up the maximum request size to, to the full amount, the full one meg. And you might say, well, why is that? And it's because if you stick it out 128 and you're sending down large block IOs, so say you send uh, three one meg IOs, uh, and you're at the default 128K, those are going to get chopped up. So that's uh, 24 128K sections that might end up on different core queues. And by the time it gets to EBS, that looks random. You know, you started with three one megabyte IOs. By the time EBS sees it, it could be completely mixed up. So cranking that up to a full meg means those three IOs stay as one unit in the request queue. So it helps with the throughput. So that's, that's recommended in general, but definitely after 4.2 when block and MQ comes into the scene. Uh, keep in mind the memory is allocated per device, so be careful. Um, if you're doing one megs, that's 32 megs of, of RAM per device. And here's the command to actually enable it and crank it up. So it's a, it's a boot level command. Uh, a second performance tuning we do recommend with ST1 and SC1 is to crank up the read ahead, uh, read ahead buffer. So this is recommended for any high throughput read workloads. It's per device, so it's per actual volume. The default is 128. Uh, play with this. This setting uh, will take you up to a meg. We've seen really great performance with two meg, four meg. It all depends on your workload. But it is very important for ST1 and uh, for high throughput read workloads to, to work with the, uh, the read ahead buffer. So hopefully by now it's, it's kind of apparent where the balance is between um, throughput versus IOPS. So the example here is an IO1 volume provision IOPS at 20,000. So it all depends on the actual uh, block size that you're sending what you can do. So on the far left side, which is the, the smallest block, so 16K, we can send the full 20,000 and get the full throughput. If we half that, 10,000 IOPS, but send double the size as far as request size and IOs, we can still do that. What we can't do is send 10,000 64K. That would obviously be 640 megabytes to the volume. That would exceed the volume's throughput characteristics. And we couldn't do that. What we can do is send the largest amount, the largest block size for the IO1, 256K, at 12, 1,250 IOPS, and that would get you to the full throughput. So it's always a spectrum between IOPS and throughput. Which means when we talk about EBS optimized, bandwidth is really important. Bandwidth matters that you know how much bandwidth you have to your EBS volume and your expectations are for that workload and how much you want to drive to the volume. So here we are with a C4 large, which has 500 megabytes, megabits, excuse me, uh, of bandwidth dedicated to EBS. 
and we've attached a two terabyte GP2 volume. Obviously that volume can do a lot more than the bandwidth that you have to the volume. So it's really not a good match. If you jump up one size to a C4 two extra large, same volume size. Now we've got double the bandwidth, so we can do 125 megabytes a second. Much better match for that volume type. You know, we can actually get to where we can almost push full throughput to that volume, what it can take. So pay attention to what you want to push to your volumes and how much actual network bandwidth you have. So here we see a full 10, so an M416X large, has an 10 full gigs of EBS bandwidth available to it. So you can push 1,250 megabytes a second of data to EBS. So if you just put one 8 terabyte ST1 volume that does a max burst of 500, you got a lot of bandwidth left over. So that's where striping starts to come into play in rating, RAID 0, where you're going to attach multiple volumes and be able to push against all of them and, and get a collective uh, uh, throughput amount for all the volumes. So when should you consider rating? When the storage requirement is greater than 16 terabytes, that's obviously the max size for a single volume. When the throughput requirements are greater than 500, uh, that's again the max for the ST1 for its uh, a throughput. Or IOPS on the IOPS end, if your IOPS requirements are greater than 20,000 at 16K, you're going to need more than one volume. But what we don't recommend is rating for redundancy. So here we see it sending down to a RAID 0 set. We talked about the replicas. You're basically emulating what a RAID 10 would do, right? You're, you have a, a, a replicated copy of every block that you're sending down to your RAID 0. But you're not paying for the two times the storage, which is what you would do with a RAID 10. So that's why we say we avoid RAID for redundancy. data is already replicated. If you're, if you're doing a RAID 1, you're having the available EBS bandwidth available to your volume because you're sending everything down twice. And same with something like a RAID 5 or 6, all that parity data is taking up your IOPS, taking up your network bandwidth. A few things on reliability. So instance failure. If an instance fails and your EBS volume is attached to it, your volume is persistent, still endures outside the life of the instance. You can obviously attach it to another instance and get access to your data. But there's also a feature called EC2 auto recovery that is enabled by EBS, which is a much better option for recovering instance failures. So you have a CloudWatch metrics on a per instance basis. So it's called status check failed system. And this is a roll up of all kinds of different health checks that EC2 is doing on your behalf to validate the health of both the system and your instance. And if the system fails and this health check fails, you can choose a recovery action within CloudWatch. So on that alarm, what action would you like to trigger? It's called recover. And we will migrate that instance to new hardware automatically, recover that instance, and it will have all the characteristics that that instance has. So whether that's the IP addresses, the instance ID, the volume mounts, everything will be the same. And that's supported on uh, any of our modern generation instance types that are EBS-only storage. And what about if you're, you terminate your instance, what happens to your volume? That completely depends upon the delete on termination flag that you set on either instance launch or volume creation. So if, if you create a volume outside of an instance launch, the delete on termination flag is set to false, which means if the instance that it's attached to is terminated, the EBS volume endures. If, however, that flag is set to true, which is the default for any volume that you launch with an instance, so boot volumes, or if you attach a bunch of data volumes to an instance when you actually launch it, the flag by default will be set to true. Those volumes will go with the instance itself which is actually a good point of housekeeping because I see a lot of customers who launch volumes outside of instance creations and they have a lot of volumes just sitting out there that aren't doing anything and aren't attached. Um, and a lot of it is because they haven't set these flags. So it's a good point of housekeeping 
to pay attention and make sure that the volumes that are out there and unattached are, are ones that you actually want to be out there. What about uh, taking snapshots? So a, a few best practices about snapshots. Um, and this is, this is really the difference between crash consistency versus application consistency. So you know, by default, if you pull the virtual plug on your instances with EBS, you will still have crash consistency, as long as you're using a journaled file system, which I hope most of you are. Um, so this is how you get, these are best practices for getting application consistency. So this is all the caches, everything in the file system and the application that's not yet committed to disk that you would lose if the plug was pulled. So for example, on a database, you flush, you lock the tables, you clear out the database caches. On a file system, you sync and FS freeze it. All, do all these things before you actually take a snapshot so that you're guaranteed that everything that's in cache, in state, and memory has been flushed to disk before you take your snapshot. And when you, uh, when you issue that create snapshot API, you'll get an answer back within a few seconds. So you only have to FS freeze for literally just a second or two before you get back an OK from the API call. You're good to go from then. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to wait for the actual transfer of data to S3 to complete the, the, the pending. It will stay in a pending state, the snapshot, but you, you can go ahead and keep using the volume as soon as that create snapshot API returns a 200 success. Windows is a little different because NTFS does not have an equivalent uh, file system freeze. So it does have a sync that's available out there in sys internals. You can download a, a sync equivalent. Um, but really, it's, it's all about VSS. So volume shadow copy service is, is, is Microsoft's technology for doing their own brand of snapshots. So what we recommend is, is what you saw with the M4 uh, case study, is attaching dedicated backup volumes for your Windows backups. Uh, all of Windows, you know, whether it's Exchange or SQL Server, they all support VSS-based backups natively. So the idea is that you, you use those native Windows backup utilities to create your backups. You store those backups on an EBS volume, and then you snapshot that backup EBS volume. So here you see here, we've dedicated uh, uh, an EBS volume just for backups. Backups are sent to that volume, and that's what we snapshot. So what about initializing a volume? So a new EBS volume, you just attach it and it's ready to go. The performance char characteristics, there's nothing you have to do to get to the full volume performance. It's ready to go out of the box. But if you're creating a volume from a snapshot, we obviously have to get that data from S3 to the new volume. So there's going to be a latency impact there because you might be hitting blocks that haven't arrived yet. So there is a lazy load process where if you do try to access a block on the device that's not there yet, it'll get queued to the front. But you're obviously still going to get a latency impact before it actually arrives. So we do recommend, if you're generating a new volume from a snapshot, and you do want full performance out of that volume as fast as possible, to initialize first. So how do you actually initialize? So we recommend a random read across volumes. And here's the file that we recommend. So we recommend file over something like DD. File is multi-threaded. It's also a lot more tunable. So random, going back to the, you know, the, the, uh, the split logical volume across a lot of physical, um, uh, physical blocks across many devices, if you randomize that, you can, you can bring that parallel nature of the volume itself to bear. If you're running a sequential initialization, you're just going to hit each of those along the line. You're not going to take advantage of the fact that this is a distributed system and all that stuff can come at you in parallel fashion. So you can play with the block size. 128 is kind of a, a compromise uh, between a file running a really long time versus your data already being there. So what I always recommend is watch the latency volume characteristics, so the CloudWatch latency curve for the volume while you're, while you're running your file. So you don't necessarily need to run your file to completion. If you're watching the latency curve and you see that it's starting to flatline, which means everything, uh, all your data is, starting, is there on the disk, so you're not having to wait for the latency impact of a new block to come down from S3, then stop the file. You're done. Um, and you can play with that block size to see what your optimal initialization uh, block size might be for your, for your volume. 
Okay, what about automating snapshots? Uh, obviously, uh, customers that generate thousands and thousands of snapshots, you know, uh, managing them, uh, life cycle of them, expiring them, keeping track of them can be a hassle. So here's a quick uh, idea of how to take a number of AWS tools to create a framework for lifecycle management of snapshots. So uh, it's based off of a few uh, key ingredients. So Lambda, our EC2 run command, which is uh, a, a way to uh, distribute system commands to all your instances. So whether that's bash scripts that you want to run, PowerShell scripts, it allows a, a centralized method of sending out those commands to all your instances. If you haven't heard of run command, there's a, a link for it. And then robust use of tagging to actually drive all of the logic of this workflow. So we start with the instance, and, and we put a couple of tag, tags on the instance itself. One, back, back me up. This is a, a backup-worthy instance. And two, any snapshots you take of my volumes, here's the retention I would like for those volumes. We have a scheduled Lambda function that's going to run every day. It's going to search for all those instances that are tagged back up. It's going to use EC2 run to send all of those good best practice snapshotting commands that I mentioned earlier to quiesce the file system, make sure it's ready, and take good snapshots. And then obviously snapshot all the volumes. And in the process, it's going to compute the expiration date of those volumes and slap that tag onto the, vol onto the snapshot itself. So the snapshot will now have a tag that says, expire me on a certain date. And then on the opposite end, for the actual life cycle expiration, we have a separate Lambda function that's going to go out and look every day for tags of expiration for that day. And it's going to delete those. So very simple. Two Lambda functions and a few tags to do some, some very robust house cleaning of your snapshots. So I hope that sounds useful. Yeah? There it is. Um, we had my team um, put up a prototype. Check it out. Let us know what you think. All right, last but not least, a uh, quick best practice around encryption. So I mentioned encryption is checkbox, um, very easy to do on your volume. Uh, there's one thing that I would recommend, though. And that is not going with the default, which is to use um, the default AWS EBS master key. We always recommend to create your own customer managed key instead of, of using the default key. It gives you a lot more control. And why is that? So this is uh, real quick, how do you create your own customer managed key? Just go into the IAM console, identity and access management, encryption keys, create a new uh, KMS master key, name it whatever you want. I named this one EBS master because that's what I'm going to use it for. And by using your own key, you get a lot more control about how the key is used. So you get to define the rotation policy for that key. You get to enable uh, CloudWatch auditing, so you can tell who's using it and what they're using it for. And you can control who can use it and who can use it for what. You, know, uh, you might want one team to use it for encryption and one team to be able to use it for decryption. And obviously, who can actually administer the key. So these options would not be possible if you went with just the default key. So here you see we're back at the checkbox encryption, and instead I've changed the master key to be the one that I just created for myself. And how does this actually work? So we use a process called envelope encryption. So this is a hierarchy of encryption for uh, EBS. So the master key that you just created is stored in our key management system. It never leaves the key, key management system. But what it does do is allow you to individually encrypt one data key per volume. So every volume has its own unique data key that is uh, envelope encrypted by the master key and then stored as metadata in the volume itself. So that's double encrypted data key in the metadata of the volume. When you actually want to mount the volume and use it, the KMS service is called again to decrypt that key from metadata. And then that decrypted key is stored in the memory of the actual instance you're trying to mount the volume on. 
So now you're actually able to access and use the volume, decrypt and encrypt the data on the volume with the key. And now why, do, why would we do this? Obviously, it limits the exposure risk. So if there's any key that's for some reason compromised, it's, it's contained. The blast radius is a single volume. It's not your entire uh, EBS inventory. The performance is obviously a huge win because the encryption is being done in memory in the instance itself where the, where the data is. You're not shipping data across the wire back and forth to KMS to encrypt bulk data. And it simplifies your key management. Um, you, you have one master key that, that can encrypt any number of data keys. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time.